uh, access controls. The point of access controls is to limit who can do what. The most obvious one is that there's going to be an administrator of some sort who's allowed to do things like create new user accounts and add new content to the web page, and lesser users won't be able to do that. So you have to authenticate people and know who they are, and then you have to have a session of some kind so you remember who they are as they travel through the app and you limit what they can do. And these are access controls, and of course you've got to test them because it's very easy to follow them up. Um, one fairly common procedure by the sort of amateurish type developers is they have like some JavaScript or something or some kind of code and they're supposed to copy that code on every page and then other people come in and they patch another code and that code isn't really patched on every page and it's not really the same on every page so the access controls are not uniformly applied throughout the app. Um, so typical vulnerabilities are vertical privilege escalation. This means you can increase your privilege like from, from a normal user up to administrator Horizontal escalation means you can become somebody else, like get in another student's account if you're a student. Um, and then there's business logic exploitation, where you can do things that you should not be able to do in context, um, like performing tasks out of order or skipping a step, like shipping the payment step when ordering something and getting the product anyway. Um, one fairly common technique is people that don't really understand how to write authentication, and I've, I've had them in my class saying, you know, what can I do to have some really simple authentication? I'll just send the password up in a cookie or something because it's too much bother to figure anything else out. And um, so they may not have to understand it all, so what they might do is just put URLs in there and hope that nobody will find the URL except the administrator. So you have do admin menu 2.jsp and they just figure nobody would guess that. So you only see that if you log in as the administrator. But once you've seen it, you can just go right to that page. And this is fairly common at browser um, configuration, uh, router configuration pages. You can just get to the admin page without passing through to log in, if you know what it is. That security through obscurity, it is very, very common that there's a obvious secret like a key under the mat. And uh, you feel like you're secure as long as people don't find it. But as soon as they find it, there's no actual security. Um, I know a friend of mine you would, oh, spoke Spanish, so she would just use common Spanish words for password and say, that'll be fine, won't it? And I say, that's the same thing, right? As long as nobody thinks of that, you're fine. And as soon as they think of that, it's worthless. Anyway, uh, so then you have to find those privileged URLs. And of course, they probably don't put a link to those URLs. Um, but you can often look inside the code and find things hidden in here, like if is admin, show the page. Um, and you can often find patterns in the URLs and guess from that. Then there's this stuff where you use identifier-based functions. So you have a bunch of documents, and instead of referring to the documents with path and file name, you make a doc ID, and then you make it long and apparently random. And then it might be that anybody that knows that number can see the document. This is what AT&T did that we've exploited. You were able to find information about iPad users by just putting a number in the URL like that, and all they had to do was write a script that would try every possible number, and they pumped out a whole bunch of information about iPad and iPhone orders. So the, um, anyway, again, this is when you don't really have access controls, so you don't really have permissions on the documents that let one person view this document and not another. You're just hoping that nobody will find the document, and only the authorized user gets a link to it. So this is, um, and one common reason this happens, of course, is because people tie different systems together. They've got part of the app you know, running on Java, they got part of it running on PHP, and they don't really understand how to pass a session identifier between these different technologies because it's hard. Lord knows I've had enough trouble just trying to get a Linux or a Mac to join a Windows domain, which is exactly the same issue. Windows domain is passing some kind of authentication credential through the network, and it's not easy to get other operating systems to play dice with it. Um, so always to make it work, you just give everybody full permission. That's the way to make it work. And you say, we'll fix this later. Anyway, um, another thing is the document identifiers might be predictable, not long numbers like that, but just simple incrementing ones. In general, URLs are not treated as secrets. So even if you feel like you've somehow created a URL that's hard to guess and you haven't leaked it, everyone else is not going to be so kind. URLs are going to be stored in favorites on the desktop and in logs and everything else because all the other systems that handle them do not regard them as secrets. So it is unwise to put a secret in something that isn't generally treated as a secret. I've had students ask me, too, what would it matter if I wrote my app so the secret was in the username and the password was not a secret? For example, City College. We have the secret for the wireless access. is published everywhere, free wireless for all. And we put the secret somewhere else. And I've, this is kind of ac completely backwards. And if you do that, this is about as good as wiring up electricity with the hot wire on the black and the, the, uh, the ground on the red. It will work as long as you're the only person on Earth. And as soon as someone else touches your stuff, it will break. So that's why standards are better. Um, 
And then there's multi-stage functions, right? Where you select the new user function, you select the department, you select the role, you have a username and password. You've got these steps, and these steps might be touching different functions and even different types of the application. And you might assume that if they got here, they must have passed through there, but that might not really be true. So you have to check that you know who they are and that they're allowed to do this at every step. And if you don't, then no one will know this for a while. This is very common. Like those, all those Android apps I found that broke HTTPS, they work to connect to the real website. The customer can get in. They don't see anything wrong. And this will work when used normally, but it will also have a backdoor that you're not aware of. Yeah? There was a very interesting bug with PayPal that was revealed very recently about yeah. bypassing security questions. Yeah. So basically, they show you a form that has security questions, and you have yeah. to answer them to, to move forward. But if you remove those from the post request, then you were allowed right. to just go through. That's right. That's right. And I've got one like that coming up in PHP. So that's, that, that's what we talked about last time. There's an application where failure causes you to get through. Yes, it's a trick. That's, I think, what was those with the uh, parking meters. When they hacked the San Francisco parking meters at Noise Bridge about two years ago, they found out that the parking meter asked your card, did you pay? And your card could just say yes, and then you paid. <laughs> it's not the other way. Anyway. Um, this is why they're charging 25 cents per transactions now in these meters? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> yeah. And then there's static files. Like, the only thing you can do is pay for a book, and then you go to some download location. And instead of this being inside the app and subject to the authentication logic, it's just a URL. So everybody, that, you can post that URL on Facebook and everybody can download the book. And this kind of thing happens all the time. I see these things go by. There's one that went by a while ago where you could get like a free USB stick from Microsoft and you could just load this page over and over and get as many as you wanted. <laughs> and stuff like, stuff like this keeps happening. Um, so uh, that's all versions of direct, um, unsecured direct object access is what OWASP calls it. Um, and then you can have, um, so one thing you often do is you have some pattern to the URLs. Like you're going to have an admin folder, and everything you have to be administrator to do is in there, which is fine. So then you'll have a series of policy rules, like certain request method, like getter post is included, the path is included, and the user role is included, and these things are like firewall rules. If these three things meet the acceptable things, then it goes through, otherwise it, it fails. And then you've got a problem. Uh, one thing that's pretty easy to do with Apache configurations is to forget about all the methods you use. Um, now mobile apps use put and uh, delete and other ways you get and post. And another fun thing is, I, did, I remember this from a CDF, CDF I did about a year ago, you can put in garbage, like un, use stupid verbs that are not legal and they will often be interpreted as get. But they might not fulfill the condition to match the rule. <laughs> So you might bypass the restriction on get, but get the get functionality. That kind of thing happens. And head might work too. One thing I didn't know is they often implement head by actually executing a get and then just not bothering to send you all the results. So it might still have the effect that the get would have had, like changing a password or something. You won't get the response, but it might work. So these are, these are the tricks. That's, uh, and uh, security tube calls this verb tampering, where you, uh, you change the method. Typically post get head options and delete and put are common HTTP methods. And the security might only restrict one method and not all of them. So there's other ways to do insecure access control. Uh, you can base it on a parameter where there is some kind of parameter coming in like admin equals true. And as we know, they can just modify that with burp and change themselves into the administrator. Um, they can base on the referrer. This is quite common. They trust you because the referrer is right. They believe you came from within their function and you must have authenticated to get the previous page, so you must still be authenticated. But again, you can modify the referrer to be whatever you want it to be. And location-based access control. As we know, if they have uh, regional blackouts, you can only play this game in the USA. You can only watch this football game 100 miles away from San Francisco or something. So the common way to bypass that, it usually breaks on geolocation of your IP address, so all you have to use is a VPN or a proxy or Tor, and then your traffic will appear to come from a different geographic location, and this will fail. Um, there's plenty of ways to mess with that. I know another fun one. I used to, um, the, staff, the City College wireless network used to be much, much worse than it is now, where frequently I couldn't connect at all and teach my class, so I went through my phone, and my phone at that time, the bridge between, uh, I think it was the Sprint network and the internet was in Texas. So as soon as I went through my phone, I was in Texas. Mm -hmm. I could do a ping and it would take you know, 10 hops to reach San Francisco and back. Um, it's commonly the effect. 
Anyway, so um, Burp has the ability to test different user accounts and compare them directly. It can do sort of a diff. So here's where you load a bunch of pages with, so you'll, you'll log in as one user and then search through the pages and Burp records it. And then you log in as the other user and search through the pages and it will calculate the difference. So this one of these is administrator, one's not administrator, and orange is deleted and blue is added or something like that. So you can see this, this says administrator if you administrator, otherwise it says something else. And you can see what changes different types of accounts have. And so here's a low level user denied uh, access to the administration page. This person gets things like lists, users, and list user sessions and stuff. That's the administrator. This guy just gets something like none, not authorized on the same page. And uh, here's an error in Burke where this is the low privilege user and this is the administrator and yet they're both able to list all the users. There's no colored areas, there's no difference. So that's a page where direct access to the page gives you administrator rights even though you haven't correctly logged in as administrator. All right, and then there's direct access to methods. Um, you can try to guess the other functions that might be available to call. One thing is you might see some kind of pattern. Another thing is you might recognize something like this thing. It's got IBM tracker debug. And if you Google that, it's using the IBM HTTP server, and that implies a whole bunch of other methods are available. So you can try them all and see if any of them forgot to put access controls. All right, and then there's static resources. You walk through the app while log as administrator, note the URLs of high privilege pages, and then log out and try them again as a low privilege user and see if you can get there. And you may find a pattern in the URLs to make it possible to guess others. Um, and the same thing here, log in as administrator, find sensitive requests, then try other verbs. Post, get, head, put an invalid request, see what happens. Um, you may find that there are unusual verbs that can be used to get in and that they're not restricted. This is what automated scanners are supposed to be doing, but they're very bad at it, so you pretty much have to do it by hand. All right. And then there's access controls. Um, like here's, here's the, the end of the chapter, they always say go switch from attacker to a defense model and talk about what you need to do. Don't rely on users' ignorance of anything. Um, don't trust any users' applied parameters. Don't assume that users will pass through your pages in the intended sequence. Don't trust the user not to tamper with data where you pounce something like is admin down to the user and then trust it when they send it again. Uh, Revalidate it before using it. Um, document your access control requirements for every unit of application functionality. This is uh, something I've heard many times. I must say in my experience it's probably true, is that good programmers spend 80% of their time planning before they write any code. <laughs> they actually bother write little documents and lists and flowcharts and make sure you know what you're doing because writing code is the easy part. Thinking through the logic is where you really make mistakes. And so here, make sure you've thought of where, what who, permissions you need for everything and then um, drive everything from the session and have one central authentication component that is written, called by every page. That way you have one place where you check permissions, you make sure they put that on every page, you don't have people copying and pasting code from page to page and forgetting it sometimes. You have, this is the same reason why you have a domain controller. If you don't have a central point of administration for the computers in your network, you will never have them working right. You'll never have all the patches at the same level on all the machines and all the user accounts on all the machines. You gotta have one place where you do it and you do it right. And then, um, and they say mandate, like the structure of your page, where everybody has to include certain code that makes the header and the authentication, it just has to be there on every page. That's the way to make sure that you won't be skipping things and that things that are added later won't be missing the access control, which is a natural mistake to make. Uh, you can add other controls. You can restrict access by IP address in addition. Uh, you can protect your static content by passing a file name to a server side page that checks to see if that file name is permitted or using other authentications like HTTP authentication if you want to. Uh, again, don't trust resource identifiers from the, from the client. They might have been tampered with. And consider requiring re-authentication before you do a critical action, even though they think they're already authenticated or two-factor authentication for critical actions. And uh, log all these sensitive activities so that if some kind of bad thing happens, you'll have some way to track down what's the problem here. All right, and that's the point I mentioned, this uh, central access control, where there is one routine that does it everywhere. This is, of course, much better. Now it's very clear, everybody just has to learn what your rules are for access control. It's the same all the time, much more maintainable. If you decide to change something, you only have one place to change it. Uh, now you can easily adapt it for new requirements, and you're gonna have fewer mistakes. You have one, just the same reason you write subroutines and reuse code. Get it working once and you can trust it. 
That's the idea. And here's um, another thing to do is have the layers of defense. Um, so you can have users sorted into types, like normal user, audit, administrator, and then you can have URLs that restrict what people can do. Only the site, only certain people can go to admin. Then you can have users in roles, what role they serve, and then you can have database privileges assigned to these roles in certain patterns so that there are levels of permission. And so if somehow they penetrate through one level, there will be further controls behind that for any of them getting too far. Um, again, a lot of planning and a lot of work, but probably less work in the long run in a big complex application like a banking application than having this stuff done ad hoc randomly. All right, and I got some eye clickers. Come grab one if you need one. One user reads another user's mail, what have you got? Horizontal escalation, which is kind of an oxymoron, but anyway. Um, all right. All right. What method of access control you, can you defeat with a VPN? That's location based. You can confuse it about where you are. All right. What technique ensures uniformity in controls? Central access control. All right, good. And <coughs> which one of these gives you defense in depth? Quit at thirty. of course, multi-layered privileges. All right. Now, there's one more thing. Now, we got a, uh, I don't think I'm going to stop on the break yet because I got a short thing to show you. But let me just stop the recording and make it separate because I can be better that way. 129S, Chapter 8.